it's kind of like the the dummy everybody in the Western world, particularly, uh, has been sold in that you know hardship is you're doing something wrong if it's hard. Um, avoid conflict. Avoid yeah. Avoid you know hard conversations. Avoid hard situations. Um, and it's just not real. Like the the growth is always in the hardship. Welcome to Justice Matters, the podcast inspiring a world where everyone belongs. I'm your host, Tim Buxton. Hey there, guys. It's Tim here. Today's guest is uh, Jeff Wilson, and I've just spent uh, about two hours talking with Jeff, and I had to actually just go away and spend some time just decompressing everything that we had just talked about. He is an extreme adventurer who's done some phenomenal challenges like crossing the Antarctic uh, coast to coast and um, going north or south of Greenland, solo adventures, spent two months in some cases alone in these adventures in some of the wildest uh, deserts of the world, the Sahara he's crossed um, and we unpack some of these journeys and the lessons he's learnt, but uh, we spend a, a fair bit of time in what's going to be a two-part series of this um, this podcast episode. Um, in the first part, we spent a lot of time unpacking his time when he was part of a humanitarian uh, trip to Banda Aceh in Indonesia shortly after the tragic tsunami um, washed into and devastated the whole, in particular, the, 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 the tip of Indonesia known as Bande Ache, killing hundreds of thousands of men, women, children. And we unpack a bit of his experiences there and we talk a lot about the, the human spirit um, and what it is inside of all of us that uh, when faced with trauma, when faced with hardship, what it is that we need um, and the perspective that we need to bring to those hardships in order to live a life that's full of adventure, that's full of hope, that's full of having an incredible impact on other people's lives. And so um, you're going to be inspired by the stories and the life that Jeff Wilson shares with us today. Um, a remarkable, remarkable person. Um, and I'm just so grateful. I get I got to have the conversation with him and, and now that I get to share it with you. So strap your seatbelts on. Here's my interview with Jeff Wilson, part one. Well, good morning, Jeff. Thanks for coming into the studio. Good to be here, Tim. I'm sorry it's an early start. Oh, no, it's um, fine with me, mate. I'm just glad that you made it in. Um, yeah. Sounds like you had a bit of a uh, hectic day yesterday. Yeah, I, I was lucky not to break my back crossing the bar just with a jet ski incident. Landed, you know, gave the back a good tweak, but uh, it's getting better. I, one of my superpowers is rapid healing, so well, <laughs> I'm relying on it again. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it reminded me of the jet ski incident that my brother had that almost killed him trying to get out across, a, uh, you know, a, a bar of a, of a seaway and... Um, yeah, the jet ski came down on him and... Oh, I can get ugly. Oh, my gosh. But you ended up still um, jumping on the foil board that you had with you and, and yeah. smashing it out. Oh, I've been struggling with the foil because we've got an adventure coming up uh -huh. that relies on foiling uh, for a crossing. And uh, on the kite, I'm fine because I've got a bar to hang on to, but I've really struggled to get prone foiling, you know, paddling into waves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yesterday we were whipping into bombs off the back of Duran Bar, which is a swell magnet near oh here. Oh, my gosh. And that w I got one wave, which was just one of the best of my life, I think. It's epic. No just, way. Yeah, just because you're riding this ocean swell, you're not waiting for it to break. And the foil almost acts like a grappling hook on the back of the waves. You, okay. You kind of, it felt like I was riding the back of the wave, not the front of the wave. It was bizarre. Really? Wow. Weird. Matt, you're like the Aussie Laird Hamilton. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> well, he was strapping into foils with boots that you couldn't release from. Yeah. Doing chopu waves like that years yeah. ago. He's, he's hardcore. He is hardcore. Um, 
Um, speaking of adventures, though, you said you've got one coming up. What? Yeah, we're training that? for. Uh, um, well, the time this probably airs, it'll it'll be pretty public knowledge. Just an attempt at the Bass Strait on foils. Oh my so, gosh! Yeah, um, that'll be that'll be an awesome one. But it's more um, an incredible story of human recovery from a good friend of mine who, when I was in Antarctica, I got this horrendous news that one of my best sort of adventure buddies, uh, Christelle Le Becon, a, a French uh, sponsored uh, kite boarder who was the first woman to um, kite from Australia to Papua New Guinea with me. Yes. Um, had just had this crushing blow where they were training down on the beach at DY in Sydney and he had a kite malfunction and he couldn't release the kite and it, it went into what we call a death loop, which is the last thing you want a kite to do in strong wind where one line suddenly gets hooked up on something and it, it puts the kite into a very powerful loop. And if you're connected to the other end, you tend to get ragdoll, oh. uh, which is fine over water. And he had one loop over water, a second loop over water where he was getting smashed. And you could see him, as a 15-year-old boy, Lexi, see him trying to release. And then the third loop, he was over a, like a groin, a rock groin. Oh, no. Suffered pretty horrendous sort of trauma and then um, either died in the helicopter or in the hospital later on. But... Frenchie had to watch, you know, the love of her life go through this. So she's gone from this warrior princess to, you know, who feared nothing and could do everything to just a blubbering mess of humanity. And I've watched that process mm. with grief myself, you know. And um, amazingly, she has started to piece herself back together and, uh, I saw her on a foil board on Instagram about six weeks ago. Really? And rang her and said, you're back in the water. And she said, yeah, I won't touch a kite again. And I said, oh, Frenchie, that'd be a shame. I don't think Lexi would want you to not kite again. Um, she said, well, I said, would you consider being uh, the first woman to foil from Tasmania back to mainland Australia? Wow. And you could hear something come back alive, you know, and uh, she's been training and, and so it'll be kind of an adventure that's all about Lexi, uh, mm. this young, young boy. And and for her, I think it's more about connecting with other parents that have lost mm. um, kids and, you know, it's a very unnatural thing for a human being to bury a very offspring, bury a child. Mm. And I don't think there would be a grief that would rip the guts out of a human being more mm. than that. Um, you know, it's happening every day all over the world. It is, yeah. Um, so I think Frenchie's goal with this story is to just provide a bit of hope that, you know, I don't think I've ever seen a human being wear their grief more visibly. And a lot of her friends couldn't handle how open she was being with her grief because it's not really an Australian tradition. We tend to internalise. Right. And Put on a face. She'll smile. be right. She'll you know. be right. Which I'm not sure is entirely healthy. Mm. Um, she was more European about it and wailing and gnashing her teeth. And mm. um, a lot of her friends left her. Because you know, oh. they just couldn't handle. You know, yeah. It's a bit, I think, like, you know, if you watch a, a zebra on the African plains, if it's injured, mm. oftentimes its mates will, will leave it because it's attracting predators. It was almost like that behaviour with Frenchie, her, her showing such open grief mm. made people uncomfortable and almost like she was attracting predators. They left her to be, to sink or swim. Mm. I think something she probably appreciated from me is that I've just checked in mm. and, you know, not wanted her to be anything other than where she was at, mm. um, despite, you know, hating watching this incredible warrior diminished. Um, mm. So it's been great in the last six weeks just feeling that light come on. And I think that's part of part of my story with adventure is yeah. that it's, you know, the whole of life should be an adventure. And if, if your life doesn't feel like an adventure, you probably need to, to look at it mm -hmm. pretty carefully because we're not here for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, part of my role is to, to get people off the sofa. So, so, 
So what makes then a good adventure? What makes um, it, um, if life is to be an adventure and embraced like that, what makes a good adventure? As someone who's, you know, ventured on incredible number of wild and crazy adventures yourself. Um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's more your attitude to it. You know, you can... You can go through the daily grind, put your boots on every morning and grumble and, and not see the dawn and mm. not see the colour and the purples just before sunset, all of that stuff. Or you can open your heart and have an attitude of wonder at you know, God's creation around you and whether you believe in a higher power or not. You know, There's evidence of God in creation around us or you just look at the beauty of it. Um. You know, you can sit, one person will look at that sunset and just see the end of a day. Right. Glad it's come, so they can have a beer and go to bed. And another is looking at it just with absolute wonderment at the light and the colour. And, and I think the adventure in life is, is making sure that we're travelling slow enough to mm. see the colour. I uh, like that. E- even in the tough times. Like I, you know, with Frenchie's story we just talked about, um, the colour in that is watching this incredible, resilient human spirit, mm. um, despite everything she's been through, piece herself back together. And then it's almost like a dawn, you know, you're watching the dawn of another another era of her life. And she'll think about Lexi every day of her life. Yeah. Um, but I think she really feels that that young boy was an adventurous spirit and would not want his mum just to curl up in a ball and suck a thumb. Yes. For the rest of life. She's a lot more stories to tell and yes. people to inspire. Yes. Um, and she's one of those women that just inspires people around her. So it'll be mm. awesome to see her back on the paddock. But I think the the well, adventurous approach to life is just seeing opportunity in everything, mm. not seeing the obstacles. And, and I think probably part of my role as I speak around the country is just to get people to understand that Hardship is good for you, um, yes. and in the hardship, look for the opportunity. Yeah, I was going to say that it, the opportunity is the obstacle. Yeah, in a way, the the challenges or the hardship you face um, is actually the opportunity for you um, to to I guess um, experience the fullness of life. In that sense, like even when you said going through life slow enough, it's like that. It's that ability to be in the present moment and not to see that moment as just a means to the end of the day, but to be fully enjoy all of what that moment that you're in right there actually has for you. Absolutely. And I think a whole system at the moment is designed to get you thinking so far forward that Mm -hmm. you're not engaged in the present. So, for example, a young couple now looking to buy property their whole life is gauged around, okay, the house market is so inflated and expensive, we need to both work hard, we need to save, we need to, Mm -hmm. you know, our whole life is about getting this deposit. They get the deposit, buy the house, and there's, you know, a euphoria for a short period of time, but it's a material possession that's going to lose its patina pretty quickly. Um, and then I think a lot of the times we look backwards and go, wow, I put so much energy and effort into something that was so fleeting. I passed up time with friends, with family, to work, took every shift available. Mm-hmm. I've used up some of my valuable younger years for this house that gives me nothing. Whereas, I mean, you can you can get to that same goal. Yes. But just wind it back a little bit. Take less shifts, more walks on the beach, more time with your partner, more time with family, more time with friends. Mm-hmm. And I think this hasn't come to me um, suddenly. You know, my first 10 years of business, we built a veterinary group called Coast Vet. Mm. And, um, you know, we were a young family. I worked incredibly hard. And um, it was a fellow called Halladen, who was this wonderful Muslim man in Ache. Mm. I was involved as a. Uh, translator for a French medical team, you know, straight after that tsunami and earthquake hit northern Aceh, there's 600,000 yeah. dead people in that region yeah. alone. 
we had been vaccinating for smallpox, measles, tetanus, you know, in a lot of the survivors. And as we left the school, which was a rudimentary sort of refugee mm. sort of enclave, I saw a man uh, laid across three school desks push, pushed together in a dark room. And I walked in and his brother was feeding him crushed up rice through mm. a straw. And I recognised all the signs of tetanus. And this is probably, by now, it would have been day 10 post-tsunami. And uh, I said to him, how long How long has it been like this? And he said, oh, it started yesterday. And, like, Clostridium tetani takes time. So you, you get a wound, the, the toxin forms as the bacteria starts to breed in the wound. So the timing was perfect for tetanus. And I said, I think he's got tetanus. And... Um, he will not survive if we don't get him help. Wow. So we loaded him into a truck and then went to the, the hospital in Bandache, which was overrun. Mm. They had nothing left. They'd, they were running out of intravenous fluid. And the American medical team had arrived the night before, before and the Aussie military hospital was coming in, in about two days. So I got on a little mo- motorbike and went and uh, went saw the medical the American medical team said, listen, this guy just needs something to relax the muscle spasm. Do you have any Valium? And he said, listen, I've got just my little hand kit. The rest of the medical supplies are locked up in quarantine. I'll give you two vials of Valium. And uh, he sent a nurse with me and said, she'll administer it. So he went, found him, gave him a shot of Valium. The nurse was so nervous, she dropped one of the vials of Valium. <gasps> And burst into tears and I remember saying, get yourself together and pretend that that didn't matter. Wow. Because Halladin was watching very carefully and I said, if he thinks that she's devastated, yeah, would just put him into more of a panic. Anyway, with the vial of Valium, you could just see him relax. He fell asleep and a lot of the signs abated while we figured out how to help him. You know, the next morning... I went back. It was about oh, very early in the morning. I had about four hours sleep. Got back on the motorbike, went to his room and uh, touched his shoulder and, and he rolled over and it was another man in his bed dying of cholera. Oh. And I'm like, where's Halliden? And he wow. was too incoherent to explain. So I found the warden for that part of the hospital. He said, no, Halliden died last night. Mm-hmm. And I just said, I've only been away four hours. I've seen, you know, multiple animals, humans, you know, their lights go out. He had so much fight. There's no way that Halliden passed away in the last four hours. So almost pushed into a bit of a manic state. I went to the morgue for the hospital. I checked every other wing in the hospital. We're opening bags in the morgue to look for him. He wasn't in there, so I knew he hadn't died. I went to three other hospitals and by the end of the day, I was notified that um, I was to leave in, in the next day okay. by our, our RAAF Hercules. So I had this sort of manic looking for him. Um, never found him. So I left. And then my wife, Sarah, was incredibly patient with me because over the next three months, I... You know, now we know what PTSD looks like. Sure. Like I went into a pretty classic PTSD state, you know, drinking too much, playing Xbox till 2, 3 in the morning, just unable to sleep, not trusting the ocean. Mm. You know, if we took our kids in and they they went in the water, I would just get images of all the babies and children dead wow. in the water up in Bandache. And, mm. um, anyway, about three months of this went by and Sarah came to me and said, listen, you, you've taken a wrong road somewhere and you're not the man I married. Um, that wrong road was in Archer. You need to go back. Oh, and, wow. And take the right road and um, you need to find Halliden because that's, that's who's haunting you. Anyway, so we, we raised some money locally for his family, what was yeah. left of it. Because he'd lost his wife and two girls mm. on the morning of the tsunami. 
Um, that wave came through their village at 90 feet. So if you think in metres, that's like 30 metres. That is ridiculous. Huge. You're not going to survive. No. Um, so his wife and girls were killed. He was carried six kilometres inland, <gasps> cutting, getting cut to pieces by corrugated iron. How he survived is oh my gosh. unbelievable. Um, so anyway, I fly back into Bandarache, and it's a different place to the one I've left. The cameras have gone. A lot of the uh, first, you know, the aid people have gone because once the cameras go, they they don't see a real benefit in being there a lot right. of the time. And, and there were some diehards still there, Oxfam and... Red Cross was still there, and uh, the refugees were housed in bunk houses rather than just in the community. And yeah. I found the refugees from Lompu, the village that Halladin was a part of. Yeah, and um, I drove in, and there was a, a Muslim sort of prayer platform mm. with all the men dressed for the mosque, all looking clean and well presented. Sure. And as I drove in, I stepped out, and Abang. Helen and his brother stood up and said, the mad Australian is back. And uh, I went and greeted him. <laughs> the <warmly>. mad Australian. <laughs> mad Australian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, bang, that is amazing to find you. Um, our family and friends back home have raised some money for you. Here's a, an envelope of cash that we've given him. And anyway, he said, listen, why, why are you giving it to me? We are Halliden's family. And he said, no, no, give it to Halliden. So <laughs> where is he? And he said, he survived. He survived. And I said, what, how? And he said, oh, when, when you came, not long after we were moved to a dying tent on the edge of the city, because the Australians were coming in, the leaders of the area were embarrassed by Halliden's condition. So they didn't want to see anyone who was on death's door. They moved to this dying tent. Um, so there was a weird loss of face thing going on. Wow. And so I followed him and, and I fed him through a straw for six weeks. And he refused to die. For six weeks? Six weeks. So if you t I was spoken to a mate of mine in, in emergency medicine. He said, without gamma globulin, without intensive treatment, survival from tetanus is almost nil. Wow. Um, so for him to survive with no medical care whatsoever other than his brother, um, just who refused to leave his side, was amazing. So he walked me through these back alleyways and then there was an open-air Mandy or, or a washing station mm. and a fella in a sarong throwing water over his muscled back mm. um, was there and I recognised some of the scars on his back being the same shape as, as the lacerations because I'd carried him from the school to the truck, from the yeah. truck to the hospital. Yeah. Put him on a gurney and so I'd seen his wounds and um, I put a hand on his shoulder and he turned around and we're both just stunned. Wow. So, and the amazing thing with this story is that um, we caught up and then in time I headed back to Australia and I left a lot of my demons there. Okay. Um, but he, was, you know, really reminded me just said, listen, you, you have no long how long, you have no idea how long you have or what your timing is, so don't put all your stock in stuff. Mm. Over a thousand interviews with survivors of that tsunami, not one of them cared about motorbikes, houses, you know, possessions, and they had little enough to start with. Every one of them was, you know, lamenting the loss of friendship, the sure. loss of family, um, you know, companion, community. So I came back with a completely shifted mindset. And I think uh, in business and adventure, I've always managed to, to, to make sure that I carve out enough time for family, for friends. I feel like I've made a conscious effort to speak slower, to be slower, yeah. to make time um, you know, just for the little things. I, I was in Brisbane... And I slept overnight in a rough hotel because I had to work in two vet hospitals that are right next to each other in South Brisbane. And I said, Sarah, I just avoid the drive, I'll stay. Don't realise how beautiful and quiet our farm is because the street noise was horrendous. It was yeah. the night of that lunar eclipse. Okay, yeah. So everything seemed to be noisier than normal. The next morning I go to buy some toothpaste and toothbrush, deodorant, 
because I didn't bring anything with me. We had the 24-hour chemist and there's a, a homeless guy out the front who asked for some cash. And I very rarely have cash, but I did have cash. And rather than just throw him the cash and keep moving, just remind myself to, you know, stop, ask him his story, mm. um, have a talk. And I think, you know, those sort of lessons Halliden taught me. Um, mm. So when I got back from finding Halliden, Sarah could see a massive shift. You know, a lot of my demons had, had gone. And, they, the, you know, the death that I saw in Arche still wakes me up. Sure. You know, you couldn't move without your foot popping through a human torso. Um, you just, there were bodies everywhere, babies, you know, in the rivers and all of the similar sized bodies accumulated in different parts of the river. So the babies were in one section, the, you know, kids, teenagers. I can't, can't um, even fathom. Yeah, it was, I, I just don't, I can't think of a natural disaster where the volume of death so big you know even turkey's earthquake bam where twenty thousand people maybe haiti had, had quite a yeah. devastating earthquake yeah they had some shock and stuff but um man just the density of it that yeah. was so hard to fathom mentally um but anyway i came home and we put all of our businesses under management and bought a sailboat out of trinidad sight unseen shipped it back to brisbane learn how to sail and then spend a year and a half at sea. And in that year and a half, I caught up on a decade worth of poor fathering. Mm. So just just not being present, not listening well and, and just really tried to shift it. So I think the adventure side is, is definitely part of my DNA. But sure. I, I think it's more through those adventures I've met some incredible people. Uh, and the tail end of that story is is literally two years to the day from when that tsunami hit. Arche, we sailed our own boat back into Lompu Bay to try and really? find try and find Halliden. And uh, I searched the old refugee camp was gone, knocked over. I looked for his brother. I went to the village. It was deserted. The only building left was the mosque. Um, and I was about to give up. We're in the back of a, a pickup truck with this poor dedicated driver who had driven all over <laughs> trying to find Halliden. And I had Sarah and the three kids sitting on a tire and, and they were hot. It had been a long day. Sarah said, listen, let's get back to the boat. You've, you've done your best. He's obviously moved, moved on. You've lost contact. And then we went past a, a road with a palm tree blockade on two 40-gallon drums on it. And I said, he's down there. Sarah said, oh, you, you're like a dog on a, on a bone. You have to give this up. I said, no, no, he is down there. So I got the driver to come in and I pulled the blockade apart and we drove through and it was a T section to the beach. The road went right to the beach mm. and there was a little thatch hut there with three fishermen with lines in the water, mm -hmm. a little estuary, and they all had caps on and I walked over and um, said, uh, does any of you know Halliden from Lompu, which is how he was known? And the guy in the middle stood up and took his hat off and said, I'm Halliden from Lompu. And I recognised the scars again and we embraced and just thought, this is the most bizarre meeting. Wow. It just wouldn't have happened. It was supernatural. Um, wow. And we've been in contact He's still Ever in, since. Yeah. yeah. So he he's been a special sort of uh, I don't know if you'd call it a flagpole mm. moment in your life where if you pinpointed a shift in your attitude, and you know I think this whole concept of your your mentors and your guides in your life having to have the same belief system or religion, of course, yeah, um, is completely false because I learned so much from this. Um, devout Muslim man mm. in an area that is now known for or was up until then known for creating jihadists against yes. my worldview. So it would have been very easy to go in there with attitude and not been open to anything. But um, Halliden to this day reminds me of so many things. I mean, that that's 
a beautiful story. I hope you do get to write that in a book and share it with the world in in some ways, although it will never have the same, I'm sure, impact it's had on your own life. Um, you know, you shared something just at the end how it's this perspective that we bring to our trauma and our pain um, and it kind of reminds me of this this story of a man who said what trauma he got diagnosed with cancer and this cancer was um, this cancer was going to end his life and instead of him saying this is the worst thing that could have happened to me he had a f- loving wife and children but he said it was the best thing that happened to him because he realized how neglectful of a father he had been and how even how he had hadn't um the exact the most important things to his life his relationships his uh, the friends his wife his children he neglected and he said for the t- <laughs> for this moment in time that i have left i'm going to become the best father and the best husband that I possibly can be I'm actually going to have the chance I have the chance now to leave a new legacy a memory of who I am to them and had had cancer not come my way I would not have had that opportunity and um it doesn't have to be something as terrible of li- or as life-threatening as that that comes our way to force us to wake up but I think there are the gifts in the challenges there are the gifts in the pain there's the gift in the tragedy that we encounter to remind us i think that's kind of like the the dummy everybody in the western world particularly uh has been sold in that you know hardship is you're doing something wrong if it's hard um avoid conflict avoid yeah avoid you know hard conversations avoid hard situations um, and it's just not real. Like the the growth is always in the hardship. The uncomfortable. You, you don't grow sitting on the couch, being in your comfort zone. You grow when you're stretched beyond what you're. Yeah, and I had I had a really unique experience last month where I got to speak to um, some of the top brass in the Australian military just on resilience development and mm. mindset development because he, even with the young soldiers they're having a real issue with uh, early tap out and um you know a lack of intestinal sort of fortitude and resilience development so just talking them through steps to try and improve that and teach that um, but alongside me was a phenomenal human coco mcquilty who is one of our most decorated medics from the afghan conflict wow. and he I think he's had 34 operations to kind of correct the damage to his body from getting thrown from an armoured personnel carrier by an IED, um, thrown 30 metres and, and suffered horrific injuries, like broken femur, broken arm, crack, cracked skull, mm. ble- bleeding on the brain. And he calls that the best day of his life. Wow. Because his whole attitude shifted. And he was in, uh, flown to Germany... On one side of him was a, a big um, Afro-American soldier who'd blown his left foot off and on the other side was his mate uh, who'd blown his right foot off. They'd both stood on the same IED and blown, it, you know, blown their feet off. Wow. And they were so happy to be alive, so happy to be going home to their family, so happy the war was over for them and joking that they had a deal with Nike where they could get one set of shoes and split it <laughs> between them. <laughs> Uh, that he he shifted, you know, his attitude. He had a Halliden type shift, yeah. Where suddenly he he was feeling sorry for himself and grumpy and angry, um, and it's been a journey for him. He hasn't sure. lied about it, but he has this incredible ability now to travel the country, creating attitude shift for people in hardship because he his whole character in becoming the man he is and the husband that he is came from what he calls the best day of his life when he wow. got blown up by an IED. So 
to hear someone like that, it really shifts your mindset towards challenge. And I think if you accept that challenge is good for you and hardship is good for you, you become a very dangerous person. Yeah. You know, your your whole ability to become a weapon or a tool in any challenge yes. radically shifts. Yes. Because as soon as you step into the fray, you know, you're smiling and going, is that all you've got? Yes. You know, come at me ready for you yes um and i would i would call that the lion killer attitude you know based off um you know that that want to run at the lion not run from the lion and you know any predator in your life whether it be cancer marriage breakdown a kid off the rails that predator doesn't want you to run at it it wants you to you know Curling a ball. Curling a ball. And there is a time for that, as we talked about with sure. Frenchie. She's Grief had a, she's and had pain. a period where she has curled in a ball and to a lot of her supporters left her because they thought she was done. She was far from done. That's a healing process. And now she's entering her line killer phase, which is hardship is good for me. Um, I don't think she'll ever call out the best day of her life, but it'll be a shaping day mm. of her life. And I, I think getting this concept across to people through adventure, through Coco stepping on an IED, you know, however we do it, it's getting the Australian public and the wider public. Yes. Especially, I mean, I, I, you've lived in developing nations, I've lived in developing nations. I, I don't feel in those countries they have such an issue with this no. because hardship is, is expected. It's part of everyday life, uh, exactly. It's expected and it's, you know... You have an easy day. That's a surprise. Mm. Um, so character is not a shortage. I think the softness of the Western lifestyle has meant that um, our challenge is a lot of our people are lost. They have no focus, no dreams, no way, and their character is diminishing, not improving. So we have to fight that through, you know, this understanding that if you're not dreaming, you're dying, mm. and uh, refire up that pioneer attitude that built our country. You know that lion killer attitude. That work is good. It's like I think there's also this sense that um, even work is is a negative thing, and it's all about it is all about play. Like, but that the two actually are good. Yeah. That they're both required and needed. And when you work, you're creating, you're building, you're you're putting in the energy and effort to make. You know, my vision for all work should be it should be about making this world a better place in Absolutely. one way or another. Giving whatever natural gifts and resources you have, put that into focused energy and work. Um, and you're a shiny example of that in that you've dedicated a large part of your life to doing that. Um, I, you know, a lot of people might feel, oh, I'm not as fortunate as Tim. I can't, I can't do that because I'm a plumber. Or, mm. you know, but it's about understanding that your core skill set doesn't mean that you can't no make the world a better place. Hundred percent, yes. Use that, use that in whichever way. And the really sad stat I saw the other day is seventy two percent of Australian adults do not enjoy what they do for a living. And that's a shame. Wow, that's huge. It's a real shame because it means you or I are in that 28% that get up every day and love what we do. But that's taken discipline and time and and slowly pushing. There's days where I'm doing my fifth anal gland squeeze on a rotwheeler and that's not fun. No. No, (laughs) Every job has jobs that you can't stand, but it's stuff you've got to wade through to get to the good stuff. Yes, but if you're, you know, to someone listening who's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm one of the 72%. I hate what I do. Then it's not about jumping out into something fun. It's about creating a dream, starting to train, uplink, upskill, so mm. that you can move out of what you're doing that you don't like into something that you absolutely are passionate about. And you're always going to be more effective and more lethal if you're passionate about what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah, if you if you hate cleaning toilets for a living, you're probably not going to clean them well. No, you know you're just going to give them a wipe and move on. Uh, but if you hate cleaning toilets and you're not creating, you know, going to night school and learning 
how to build fighter jets or whatever mm-hmm. it is that you want to do that's exciting and fun, you've really only got yourself to blame. You have to be moving and training and stretching. And we talked about earlier, the, the stretch is where it's at. So if you're one of that 72% that consider your work work and dull and boring and horrible, then you need to move progressively to get out of that because it's not good. It's not good for the human condition to continually be in something that drains you or, or you hate it or you find it horrendously stressful because it's outside your skill set. Um, I think, you know, if we could encourage people to to move into their skill set and into their passion area, mm. we find a much happier workplace for everyone around them, but also healthier families. Thanks for listening to this episode of Justice Matters. I'd also like to shout out to the Patreon community that financially supports this podcast. Guys, thank you so much for your support. And you can join them simply by going to patreon.com forward slash justice matters, where a simple donation of $5 a month, you can become part of the Patreon community and get access to behind the scenes content and extras that I share just with you. And lastly, there is another really important way that you can help support the podcast, and that's simply by rating it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, maybe by subscribing on YouTube. Yes, we are a video podcast as well. Guys, thank you so much for listening in to this episode. Justice Matters, please come again soon. I can't wait to share more episodes with you. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Tim Buxton. Thanks for listening.